ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good evening. Uh, my name is Kate Moss. Um, I'm a novelist and a fledgling playwright and for the purposes of here, wrote the biography of CFT to celebrate its 50 years. Um, it's my great pleasure this evening to be reprising, although th today we have two for the price of one, um, the interview that Jonathan Church, the director and the artistic director, of course, of CFT, and I did last year for his production of Arturo Ui. And we're delighted to be joined this time by Simon Higlett, whose list of credits here well, if I started reading that, we could just say thank you and good night, and then you wouldn't have to speak. Um, but it's the designer of, of the show. What we were to do, as you know, is Jonathan has brought back Arturo Ui to play for a couple of weeks here in the Minerva um, before it transfers to the Duchess Theatre um, in London. Now, is it one of those decisions that's very easy to make, the idea that you'll bring a cast back because it did so well, you got five-star reviews, four-star reviews, it was one of the great triumphs. Is that why you brought it back, or was it always on the cards that you would do that? No, we didn't know. We, we thought it was a huge challenge to bring Brecht to Chichester. Ch <laughs> Chichester isn't, hasn't been known in the past for uh, you know, half a dozen great productions of Brecht, slightly surprisingly, given that part of Chichester's fame is great leading roles for great leading actors. So it was with some trepidation we programmed uh, Brecht and Arturo Ui last year. I, I mean, I've, I've done uh, another production and I've been a, since a child, seen productions and a huge fan. So it was, it was a sort of personal desire to try and bring Brecht here. I also had a, a theory that uh, you know, Brecht is one of the great playwrights for large stages. And I know we've done this in the Minerva, um, but there's something about him as a writer that I'm interested in, in, in exploring with us. So, yeah, we did it very cautiously. Um, and we did it really only because Henry Goodman wanted to play, play the role. Um, it, you know, all, a lot of Brecht's plays need absolutely stunning leading actors and the right leading actor. And, and, and Henry was that. Putting it back together, there was, so there was no plan last year apart from just doing it and hoping we'd find an audience and hoping we'd do it well. Because also, you know, Brecht doesn't always... It's not always easy to do, <laughs> or, or, get, or, or get or get right, um, or get an audience interested in. So what was great was last year. Um, not only did we, I think, do it quite well, but the audience um, decided they liked it and started to come. It wasn't sold out in advance, but by the end of the run was, uh, and we ha had a number of people who were interested in trying to get it to London. But again. Trying to get Brecht into the West End <laughs> is, is get not easy. I can't think of the last time uh, that that occurred. Or again, it's been with a very big uh, star. I think the last time this play went into the West End was with Griff Rees Jones. Was that 20 oh, yes. years ago? Mm. Um, so, and originally Leonard Rossiter had done it in the West End in the 60s, but that had taken two or three goes. It had been on in, Scot in Scotland at the Sit, it had been on in Nottingham, and then finally made it the West End and Leonard Roster was quite a big name in those days so it's, that was a challenge and um, it's only through a combined group of producers who've been willing to risk their money in the West End that we're doing it and a very enlightened theatre owner Nika Burns who owns the Duchess Theatre saw the production and fell in love with it um, and wanted to try and help us get it into to London. But back to your second bit of the question which was getting the cast back together so of course having not planned this we had to start from scratch and say to everybody, might you be able to do it next year? I think the, 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 the delay helped us, because it's been a year later. We were able to, some months ago, go back to everybody, and all but two of the original cast mm. have been able to do it. And I think part of that is they had a good time, but also everybody who does a play like this, they do it because they believe in its message, mm. um, which I think Brecht would be proud of. You know, they want the political content, what it has to say to an audience, now is, is important. So I, I felt the cast who'd committed to the play for that reason in the first place recommitted to it and, and wanted to be part of that challenge um, of bringing it to London. Because I promise you, nobody's getting rich going to London uh, <laughs> to, play to play Brecht. You surprise us, Jonathan. In a 500 seat theatre. In fact, it's such a small theatre, it's 500 seat theatre. Uh, quite how we're going to fit everybody into the dressing room yeah. is a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> We, it's, it's rather famous that uh, Brecht wrote this terribly fast, the spring of 1941, and it was never produced in his lifetime. Now, I know when you were putting the production together, the two of you last year, you went to Berlin, um, mm -hmm. as all good chaps should do, um, <laughs> put, putting on Brecht. Yeah. 
Why did you do that? Was it for the spark of inspiration that was going to give you your production? Jonathan, do you want to say a little yeah, bit about it and then Simon? No, you go, because... Uh, no, you, you say. Well, <laughs> Well, it wasn't just a, some sort of ghastly stag weekend, no, I was didn't it? Actually, I, was actually, no, 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 didn't. I didn't actually go. Didn't ah, go. Yeah. I was you too go, busy. Yeah, you, ah, you <laughs> see. We thought, no, we went, we, went, yeah. we, went, we went for... There was, a produ there was a production that the Berliner Ensemble were, do were doing, and we wanted to go and see it. We also wanted to go and um, uh, see uh, Brecht, the Brecht Museum uh, and, and just also spend as... Uh, we, we didn't take time, and we took... This was before we got... That far, we took uh, Alistair Beaton, who helped us with the translation, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Matthew Scott, who uh, was composing. And we, we went thinking that the production m might be, I'm sure if we'd done our homework, we'd have known, might have been linked or been a version of the one that was done by the Berliner Ensemble just after Brecht's death. It wasn't. It was some <laughs> 1980s version directed by a German opera director that was so wacky <laughs> um, that the prologue was done as the epilogue. The first 10 minutes were a naked man grunting and running around the stage with beasts in the boxes of the theatre uh, as if this was a sort of birth, you know, in a barn. I mean, mm. it was completely nuts. And, and the, 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 the other thing was, that the, 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 and, and, and please forgive me if the, uh, there, I, I'm a great lover of German culture, but the German idea of what an American gangster is <laughs> was, was quite complicated and, and the music they chose. And, and mm -hmm. so in many ways it gave us the, op I mean, in some ways it gave us the opposite of what we thought we'd get. It was, instead of some, you know, real, really interesting... Subtle uh, uh, subtle and, yeah. No, yeah, it was, it was completely, and, and, it, and it made us go, hang on a minute, let's look at this text again. Let's um, look at why they might have made those structural choices. I mean, the other thing was much more just about Brett, you know, about Hitler. To be, you know, to be quite frank, the issue of dealing with this play in Germany at any point yeah. is complicated. And so the, the director and the company were much more focused on the parallels with Germany and this central rise to, 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 to power of this man, obviously. So they cut out an awful lot of the play. I suspect there was only two thirds of the text that we use there, um, and which was quite shocking because you imagine the Berliner Ensemble, like the RSC, would be about preservation. It was quite exciting in a way mm. to see that they weren't, that they were was about. Was that quite liberating that you yeah. could see that they were taking license, as it were? Because yeah, no, it, yeah. was it was it was it was very very liberating, and it was also there was something very powerful about seeing how. Um, that the, that audience and they reacted to it, you know, to remind us that it's challenging, that this, you know, to see it in an environment where this man really was in charge. Um, it had a whole. It reminded us of just how important mm. an act it was writing the play. Because of course, Brecht never Brecht never saw it performed and actually chose not to. He ran the Berliner mm. Ensemble after Hitler was out of power. He chose not to put mm. it on. It was only put on after. His death, and you can see why it would have been you know, incendiary in many, mm. in many mm. ways. I also think, as a great uh, playmaker, a little bit of him might have suspected that it was always going to be better done in America or England, mm. because because of the whole gangster thing. Mm. Um, you know, mm. he, he'd he'd written mm. it in America. I think he'd imagined it would first be performed in America. Yeah, he'd Fine. seen Scarface. No, Brecht had seen Scarface, which is I think, is it there? So, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a clue. Uh, so, and that was a real inspiration for me, watching that film, which was the 1932, I think, version of Scarface, which is, has many parallels and, uh, and gave me quite a lot of insight into how to approach it. Because presumably that, that decision is at the heart of it, whether you are not inspired, and it's the wrong word really, but inspired by the Nazi parallels and the history and you design to that, or whether you play bigger on the gangster. And presumably that was one of the decisions you had to make, Simon. It was, yes, it was. And, um, uh, and I try to do both. I mean, I hope my, my kind of Nazi comment is, is quite subtle. And, I, and I'll tell you now that this is actually Auschwitz, or modelled on the arch of Auschwitz. And yeah. all the doors and uh, fittings are the gas chamber doors. And, but they're also a cauliflower warehouse in Chicago, because uh, we ended up with references for both. And uh, 
they're, they're quite easy to merge. Uh, but you don't need to know it's Auschwitz. But it it's kind of subtly is. And once you know that with the railway line and the arch... That, yes, that I, I, that's, that's when it yeah. becomes clear, I think, that, yeah. that sort of But you don't terrible kind moment. of... You know, it's just there sublim subliminally. And uh, I hope that that comes across. And, it, it's, and the black came from... Don't know. Watching black and white movies, really, and uh, and the kind of film noir of it all. See, that was the amazing thing about uh, Scarface, the movie. It's fa it's a famous film, and you must go and watch it because it's nothing like the no, no. Robert, uh, was it Al Pacino one yeah. later or Robert mm. De Niro. Uh, what, what's extraordinary was the director Howard Hawks. I mean, it was incredible cinematographically, but there was this wonderful thing that they did that uh, whenever somebody was going to be killed yeah. Oh, yeah. cinematographically. He made sure that somewhere in the shot, just before somebody was killed, there was an X on the screen. And it was slipped in in really clever ways. So a, a gangster arrives at a hotel room and there's an X. <laughs> Instead of the number on the hotel room, there's an X. When um, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, um, which is contained in this, um, it, it, where Capone goes and kills it, the, the shot starts. On a, in a sort of warehouse, brick warehouse, but it starts up in the roof, and there's a shot of a, a steel girder, and then the shot pans down to the guys being shot. Within the steel girder are seven crosses. So, in, in a way, if you see, the, hmm. the, which is the scarf, the, the, the brick, the metal, this was all in these. It's mm. film Scarface and a lot of gangster gangster movies. So, the, but but it's a wonderful it's a wonderful film to watch because mm. Brecht okay. actually watched it. He also watched um, uh, the Great Dictator, the Charlie Chaplin, yeah. um, which, which in terms of where the, some of the humour in the piece mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is very you know, quite surprising in a Brecht in a Brecht piece. Well, I mean that that is what is so wonderful. I mean last year. Um, when I was interviewed, you know, I just basically gushed for about four to five minutes, which is dull, obviously, for people who hadn't yet seen it. But it was, it was precisely that, the cleverness with which you laugh, because he's a pathetic character and everybody's laughing at him, and the need of the audience to laugh, and then suddenly, there he is. You know, he is Hitler at that moment, and, and that is incredibly clever, and the gangster references bring that out mm. incredibly well, I think. Th th there was, again, a very liberating thing for us, because you've touched on the, the gangster, the Nazi thing. There was Because, there, there of course, everything that happens in the play parallels something that happened in Germany. Um, and, and many of the characters, obviously, Uwe is Hitler, um, Roma is Ernst Röhm, uh, Jiri is Goebbels. I That's right, yeah. Okay. Um, that everybody, you know, so it's all charted out in that way. I read a marvellously liberating thing from the original director in Germany who said, we spent the first week of rehearsals trying to be the German characters we represented. We then just had to give up and just try and be the gangsters mm. because you couldn't do the two together. And that, was, you know, that for me was really liberating because, mm. of course, yeah. you worry about how much of that you've done. And one of the big decisions that we had to make is... In no, what, the placards. Brecht, Brecht, yeah, Brecht, yeah, Brecht tinkered with the play um, after he'd written it initially very quickly. And one of the things he added was, I think he called them legends, where, and he does this in other plays, where at the end, at before or after a scene, he would tell you in, in writing that was presumably meant to be projected or carried across what the parallel was. So he would go, at what we call the Valance and Valentine's Day Massacre, is the Night of the Long Knives, where Hitler killed Ernst Röhm and a number of his SS generals just because they were getting out of hand and also he needed to move up the social strata and not be seen to be uh, hanging with around with thugs, thugs anymore. Yeah. So, so um, but, but he, lit, he, he experimented with, do you just tell the audience that this is the, the parallel? And we had to decide whether hmm. to... In fact, I think we left a space on the top of the arch and we never <laughs> used it because we discovered that once the play begins and runs, you, you really don't need it, do you? It's, yeah. it, it but, um, but I, I mean, one of the other things, I, and I don't know if this mm. is how you felt, that, you know, this spe a thrust stage is, is so right for, for Brecht. Mm. And he always talked about preferring stage builders rather than painters, didn't he? Mm. So did that mean for you that you had this sense of 
a proper 360 degree design in a way that you wouldn't necessarily on a more traditional proscenium art stage. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Doing it as a, as a picture, as I call it, as, which is the Duchess, which is the smaller model where we're moving to, it's much more difficult for this piece. Uh, the <laughs> fact that you're this close to, to Henry, really, uh, at the sides is, is extraordinary and it's a perfect space to do it. Uh, much, even better than the main house, I think, because you're so involved. Uh, and especially at the end when, when we stand the, the, um, the gangsters on the, on the seats and the the, it's uh, hard not lights, to clap, so. you know. Yeah, yeah. When, when they are doing that, that scene, and they are clapping, mm. in the audience you almost feel mm. like it's a mistake not to join mm. in, mm. which I think is, is a wonderful yes. thing. Well, these lights, you can see above you, the other thing that we, uh, we looked at is because many of the scenes are public, Uwe is talking to grocers or the rally at the end, well, more grocers, we, we, we wanted to involve the audience. So it, in terms of... The closest thing to a Brechtian technique, which we, you know, we, we, of, we often didn't talk about that, but, but we wanted to see whether we could include the audience. So there's a point where the Cicero grocers and the Chicago grocers arrive, where the lights come up on the audience. So we, we, we include them. We even went, and we didn't do it, you'll be glad to hear. There was a point when you were all going to be on wooden benches, oh, yeah. and, you were all, <laughs> and you were all going to be grocers. Was on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was my, one of my first ideas, yes, was actually take out the first two rows and put everyone on wooden benches. So you'll be glad we didn't do that. Well, last year when I was interviewing Jonathan, he did talk about not alienating the audience. Right. So I think that That's might right. have that was, fallen yeah, in, that into that. But, right. I, but actually, something you said earlier, Jonathan, about you know, Brecht is seen often as this epic right you know one of the most important things but in many ways the festival theater i mean last year it was open obviously it, it it's not available this year that would be seen as the epic space and this possibly is the psychological space mm. so how did that change how you designed and, and put the production together in in brechtian terms i suppose well uh, the Bre uh, hmm. it always really worries me that that phrase i know when i began to when we approached it i thought oh no i'm gonna have to look this up and work out what it exactly it means, because now, for once in my career, I'm faced with, it's the first Brecht play I've ever designed. So it was, it was tricky that moment. And there's you a whole do choice. More. There's a whole <laughs> choice of, of whether you do the whole pure Brechtian technique. And my wife teaches it to university students, so I kind of knew, and it's, it's hard to watch, I would imagine. And um, so uh, I deliberate, we didn't go down that route. I see another production that, that I went to see again doing homework, and I won't say where. I went to see another production, uh, and I think they'd attempt. You know, a lot of the things that you relate to Brecht, some of these techniques that he uses um, to destabilise an audience and make them. St you know, we, we we in in our theatre world and Stanislavski, who's at the opposite side to Brecht. You know, a, a lot of what we do in British and American theatre is look at making everything as real as possible, and you know, as you know through. You, Chekhov on, that you try and create a naturalistic world that people get sucked into. Brecht often wanted you to step out, the audience to step out, not just be seduced mm. by that, asked to look outside of it. Well, I mean, I think that happens anyway in, in this production, in this play, just because of the scale mm. of the ideas. And, and in this space, you always mm. know you're in a theatre. You always know you can see the audience. Yes. So yeah. that is a big so, thing. So I think, yeah. back to the question of, of, of what this space, in, its, in a way, this kind, I think Brecht would have approved of thr a thrust theatre because the relationship, the audience always knows they're watching a play mm. with, and they're watching another audience watching that play. So I think you might argue the very space has an element of, of, of what Brecht would mm. have wanted. The, the other thing that's particularly, and I'll go back to this other production in a minute, but what was we found reading the play is he's also written as well as a, a gangster, you know, a, a gangster film. It's a, it's a mock Shakespearean play. It's written in verse, most of it. It, pa uh, it parallels a lot of Shakespearean plays, but particularly Richard III. And the production I went to see did some really dazzling, bold, visual, stylistic things that worked for the scene changes and worked for the first two minutes of every scene. As a Shakespeare play, most of the scenes are 10 minutes long. And, revolve, and involve really complicated relationships. Mm. And, and so I came out of that production going, <coughs> doesn't matter what you do, what start, if the story and, the, and the, mm. if you like the Shakespearean development of the characters and the story don't work, you haven't got a play. You can be as dazzling, as impressive, mm. as technical and as Brechtian as you like, but this play 
doesn't lend itself to not being performed as you would a Shakespeare play. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's very interesting, that, that idea, and, and picking up mm. on what you were saying, Simon, about your wife teaching that, there will obviously, particularly when the show transfers to London, there will be students mm. um, who are studying mm. Brecht. And how much responsibility do you feel as a director <laughs> and a designer, uh, knowing that Brecht, along with Beckett and a couple of others, are seen very much often as te text to be studied, mm. theories to be mm. studied, you know, do you feel, actually, you want to fly in the face of that? Or do you feel that you just take what you need from that intellectual mm. analysis and leave the rest mm. in the classroom? I think you have to, really. I yeah. think that's the problem. If you did a pure Brechtian piece of theatre on this, I think it would be deadly dull. I think, I think Because it would, it would be theory rather yeah, than passion. Yeah, and it's an extraordinary story. And I think the way we've told it, and it's very simple, the way we've told it, it's just a flaw. This is a backdrop to it. And it's also slightly Shakespearean in that it's got a, a kind of bridge and a tiring house, which I know I looked at Shakespearean shape as well when I did this and melded it all oh, together. Brecht gave a note, didn't he, at the beginning yeah. of a script that also informed us, which was actually about simplicity. Oh, yeah. What did... I can't remember. That. No, I can't. <laughs> no, but it led to we'll you be on looking... the website soon, ladies and gentlemen. But it led to you looking at the Shakespearean tiring house that, yes, idea. Exactly. Yes. There was something about a simple two-level... He talked That's about... Right, I think was. he even used the word Shakespeare. And tiring but he, but he, house, yeah. Tiring house. Yeah. He talked about a simplicity that related to that, that mm. I think led, led, you, led yeah. you to that. Um, the, I think the, the other thing is, you know, Brecht, Brecht is a practical theatre maker... I mean, that's the other thing that dazzled me about Berlin. I was expecting um, a slightly more modern theatre. I thought the Berliner Ensemble would be in some, I don't know why, uh, concrete bunker. Um, <laughs> a bit like the National. You know, like, I was imagining the Littleton. Um, you know, that, a dreadful modern proscenium. It's the most beautiful, old, curved... Um, for glorious, glorious space. Glorious yeah. um, old theatre. Um, one of the deepest, most operatic... I've never seen such a deep proscenium stage. Oh, Absolutely beautiful visually. Uh, and I didn't expect it. So um, uh, there was something about that that... Um, I, I think Brecht, if he, as a practical theatre maker, would have liked our approach. I think the reason he imagined it would be done by American or British actors, not German, is, is our, love of, you know, our love of Shakespeare. And the, pl the playfulness that you can... Yes, and so moving away from the, the, the sort of the theory, um, because I would hate you to not think that this is the most astonishing evening that you're going to have in the theatre, because it is really one of the most wonderful productions I have seen here, indeed anywhere. And I just want to talk a little bit... You've mentioned the business of the language, the, the verse. Was that a very big decision about how... Um, Shakespearean, they played it or not, because sometimes it's almost just like any other conversation, and other times you can hear the rhymes and the half them. rhymes at the end of the line. So, how did you decide to direct the actors, or did you let them choose? Well, we let, we let I mean, uh, I think in a way that, like with most Shakespeare plays, there's mixtures of, of verse and prose, and there's times when he writes the end of most scenes finishes with a couplet. Um, the, the degree to which, in the first prologue, the uh, like any prologue in a Shakespeare play, the, 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 the character is given the most wonderful verse. Mm. So I think we were led, in a way, by the play and the translation, where it was rich and deliberately um, obvious that he was trying to make rhymes or try and use the, ver the power of the verse to uh, emphasise a, a section. We, we, we allowed it to be... I mean, the, we... There are other times, as with any way you'd approach a Shakespeare, now there are times when to get meaning across. I think that was always it. It was back in the story. That there's times when to get meaning across, you, we would <coughs> allow the, the, the ourselves to be less slavish with the verse, uh, where we felt what's going on with the characters and the situation and to make something dramatic or frightening or, or, or even a joke. We would mm. break to allow ourselves that freedom. But, but in a way, that's what you do with any Shakespeare play these, these days. And then there's other times when we would sit there and go, actually, what will help us with this scene is to honour the verse. There's the most dazzling scene in a flower shop where it's like a dance. The verse is so perfect for about... And it's normally cut from productions for about five minutes at four characters 
just do couplets. And it's it's almost one of the bit right. So of course you yes, go. Yes, it felt like a, it feels like a waltz. <laughs> yeah, yes. we've sort of in and out. Yeah. And so so you go. What we'll do is rather than shy away, you go. We'll absolutely commit to it. So I think it was both about where do we honour it, where do we make mm. it, we emphasise it and use it, and and where do we stand back? And like any practical theatre makers, we used what served us at any at any given moment. And I, you know, I suspect you know, breath was nothing but practical. <laughs> yeah. th yes, theatre maker. What did he call it? A history farce. Arturo, that, that seems a wonderful, um, yes, that is good. you know, yeah. the proper description of all, and the, the farcical elements, the humour of it. Yeah. You know, you've touched upon it um, already, but there is, of course, one scene um, that is the scene, the comic scene, when when Arturo Ui is learning how to sit and to stand and to walk and to speak, and a drunken actor is brought in to teach him how to pronounce. Uh, Julius Caesar speech, um, or Brutus's speech. Um, is it difficult to not let that become, you, you know, the circus almost? Because it, it's so funny. I knew what was coming and I was laughing before actually Keith Baxter had started to speak. Um, Keith Baxter, one of the great Chichester actors you will all know, who, who plays the actor in, in that scene. It, it is, I, I think... Because it could unbalance but this it, is where it? you talk about... I mean, this is where it's interesting what we think Brecht's on about. I think within... within Because the, the ideas are so dazzling, you can both... I think this is what's interesting. I, I think anything that you might read and study about Brecht, you think of as separate from what, what we might normally do in Stanislavski-based theatre, you know, where you... I, I don't think that's true. Within the heart of a scene like that, you know, he's taking on Hitler's love and manipulation of the arts. But, and and, and it, I think he did get coaching from an actor. But, but it's, it's both the most wonderful, comic, detailed scene. It's also the biggest series of political statements because what, he, you know, what he's teaching him to do is walk and talk, to, be, to walk and talk in the way Hitler did. So you've got... These huge, broad political brushstrokes sitting alongside these huge comic brushstrokes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's again what what he learnt from seeing Charlie Chaplin and the and the, yeah. and the great dictators. Because of course, the irony is, um, I think uh, Hitler rather liked Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> so the fact, I think, it's what Brecht and Hitler had in in common. Um, uh, but, but there's, I, I keep you know, I keep feeling a bit like Arthur Miller and the Crucible, where the very act of writing a play because he couldn't write about McCarthyism, set in a different period isn't about it. You know, he couldn't write about Hitler while Hitler was in power. So the very act of writing, you, know, you might argue that the very, act, the very act of writing a play is set somewhere else that parallels something is Brechtian in its own, you know, mm. just in its construction. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. And it's, um, it's an astonishingly strong cast as well. I mean, Henry Goodman is, is quite incredible in the, in the lead role. But then there's also the wonderful William Gaunt. We mentioned Keith Baxter. There's, um, you know, Joe McGann is amazing. Michael mm. Feast is amazing. There is a lot of physical work on the stage. Now, presumably, Simon, when you were designing, that you also had to bear in mind the need for big spaces sometimes, if there were mm -hmm. going to be shootouts, there's you know, going to be mm -hmm. other rather wonderful things that we won't spoil for people who haven't yet seen it. Um, but how does that affect that need to have both big and very intimate spaces when you're designing something like this? Uh, it's relatively easy in, in this space. It's, that's what's the joy of the Minerva. It, it is actually quite a big stage. I think this stage is the same size as the main house, bizarrely, although the auditorium isn't, obviously. Uh, and so it, it's a big space. Uh, and then relatively easy to make small, like we're doing here. It's, it, it works very well. It's a really beautiful proportion. So not, not particularly difficult. You only need a few objects that are the essence of each scene uh, to divide that space up, and it's, it's done. And it's, but how different will that be when it goes into the Duchess? <laughs> very different. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite a challenge. Which is why you bought your models, isn't it? It is. I just wanted to... And, and they're a long way away from you, so when, you, when we're done, do come and have a look. But it's, it's one, of, one of the biggest challenges I've ever tried to do is to convert something I was very happy with here to, to that small space. Uh, and it is tricky, uh, mainly because the audience is sitting out there and not at the sides. Uh, so they're not complicit in quite the same not, way, maybe? No, we're trying 
desperately hard to make them. We, we've got two thought. I mean, there's mm. two. One thing that isn't shown there is one of the great features of but this design, but this theatre is this central entrance, and obviously we've got the railway track here coming into it. Something we've done that we've never done before. We've often, when we've taken stuff into London, tried to push it as far out of the proscenium as possible um, and keep this shape, which we've tried this, this sort of point. For the first time, we, we're taking a walkway right the way th through over the middle of the theatre. So we, we keep this idea of the railway tracks um, and, and for two or three key moments as a procession for a funeral, we're going to replicate what we've had here, which is, again, quite, quite unique. It'll hopefully give us a different <coughs> type of connection with others. We're also experimenting with it at the moment when you have grocers in a rally. We want it to be you, but we sit half a dozen people on stage on boxes, on we may not be able to do that on a proscenium. So what we're experimenting intellectually with doing is what happens if they stand at the front or sit mm. with the audience, so that you literally become um, again, is that a Brechtian device? Is that a practical? Mm. Device? I don't know. But we're we're um, we're going to try some other ways to connect with the audience. I also think as scary as Henry is <laughs> here. Um, he can only be scary to one bit of the audience at a time. <laughs> you know what I mean? At the, there was a moment when we walked into the Duchess, and what the proscenium offers if, is if, if a, he or any of the actors walk down to the front of that stage, you're higher, it's very intimidating. Mm, and it may true. be that we can gain a, a, an extra degree of mm. a, a frisson of fear um, through, through that space, or, or keep the focus mm. of that um, yeah. better. Than, than mm. we can. Because you'll have a, the audience will have different images. There'll be the big Nuremberg rallies and all mm. of those things. Whereas here, of course, it feels domestic yeah. in, yes, in a, very much. a different yes, sort of way. Yeah. Well, it's I mean, it, it's um, one of those extraordinary things, presumably, to revisit a production that you were happy with. Were there, were there any things when you came back that you thought, oh, <laughs> oh, I might we, do this instead of we, that? We've or, made a few tweaks to the text, yeah. design-wise. Yeah. Not Is really. No, 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 no. I was, I was. Very happy with it, and I'm not usually. I usually, <laughs> I usually sit there thinking, "Oh dear, uh, I wish I hadn't done that." But this one, I was really happy with, and it, it seemed to click really well. They often, they do. I and I do quite a few a year, and you know instantly when you get when you get it right, and it's almost instant in a flash that you know. It, and this all came together so quickly, and it's the ones you really struggle with that you think, "Oh dear." I'm never really happy with, but this yeah. I was very happy with. So it, it's a it's a privilege to do it again. It's a privilege to work on such a fantastic piece of writing and to work with Henry. It's extraordinary. So it's great, but putting it in in there is going to be interesting. I'm sure we'll make it work, but it's it's interesting. I'm sure you'll make it work. Um, before I throw it open, in case there are any questions um, for the last couple of minutes, uh, I think we must also mention the music and the sound design. Um, you know, Matthew Scott, who obviously is the associate music director here and also at The National, has written a very, very good article about Vial and Brecht in the programme, I think. It's a wonderful programme. But there's this great sense from the very beginning of the speakeasy, these sort of slouchy women and the sort of... But actually, that was another design thing, because, of course, we, we, we made it partly influenced by this space. We made a decision that, that uh, I think Uwe inhabits several... Uh, areas in the in the original text i think where he where we see him represents the social climbing that went on so i think he's in a bar he's then later in a posh hotel we didn't do any of that we decided that we'd locate all of his scenes in what we called the speakeasy mm -hmm. so the, much more rooted in the gangster the world and that led into which i think okay we've got an idea from mm. speakeasy <laughs> We'll have live music, so we've got a number of the company play music, which we know Brecht liked in things, and and it, yeah, it kind of has become, it's grown from the, a little idea of let's set it in a speakeasy mm. into this band do twenty minutes before the show. So if you're yes, come in early because <laughs> there's quite a lot you miss if you arrive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. With, mm. with two but it, but it's also very clever because it again reinforces that same message that. All of this happened because people, in a way, were sleeping. 
Mm. That act, it, you know, you're in a bar, the music, you know, you can't beat a muted trumpet, can you? Yes. You know, there's all of mm. this going on, and little by little behind the scenes, this is happening. So mm. it's a wonderful layering that starts before you even realise you're you're watching mm. the show. Well, well, one of I think again, Brett said something about the, you know, there is a, there's a there's also a journey into fear, uh, and, and with all the humour and farce, I think the final epilogue says darkness in the heart of farce, mm. uh, that we everything in and it's design, music, Henry's performance, it's all about charting that, that journey um, and making it the biggest journey possible. Um, and as you say, the more you're seduced into um, not knowing where you're heading, the more like the, you know, the, the, the final message of the play is if, if, yeah, if you don't do anything, it could, you know, all it takes is a few good people to turn a blind eye and this, this can happen again. Um, the, the whole idea of the piece is that, yeah, you, of sh showing, and as you say, it's, it's very tempting to join mm. in and clap at the mm. end, particularly mm. with an actor as charismatic as Henry doing the final mm. speech. It's a great message that's woven through it, and a great, you know, a great construction he's made that we try to echo in everything, design, mm. you know, design. Mm. And, and maybe more than anything, that a ridiculed man is a dangerous man mm. yeah. you know it's a different sort of thing <laughs> now we've got time for a couple of questions if anybody would like to ask um mike um it's just to say that new park theater last night there was a film jonathan, jonathan introduced, introduced it yes <laughs> um, of yuri uh, uh, sorry, yuri uh, i think about 40 years ago it was a black and white film it was actually it was not it wasn't as old as you think it was made no, in 19. it was made, uh, made black and white and it put for effect yeah nicole williams um yeah. Excellent. I just wondered, if Simon, if you'd seen it, whether it drew anything from it. No, I haven't design. seen it. No, I haven't <laughs> seen it. So, uh, so you're pure. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw it years ago. Henry confessed that he found it. It's all pieced. You can't. It's hard to get a copy of it. It's all pieced together on YouTube, and a couple of the costuming decisions he made were influenced uh, okay. by it. Yeah. You haven't seen it yourself, I saw it. I saw. I saw it about twenty years oh, ago, but really. don't remember it. <laughs> yes, it's a comment, really. <clears throat> I was struck by when you were talking about. Uh, that think of people think of Brecht as something that you study, mm. and you know you sort of think Brecht, mm, yeah, well. and what you've done with this production, certainly as far as I'm concerned, is bring Brecht totally to life mm. and make him not human. Mm. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Or more accessible? Or accessible yeah, absolutely. And I'm very conscious of that. Mm. But, but 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 I think like a lot of things you study. It can change your relationship with it. I know, as as a, as a you know, I remember studying Shakespeare, um, and yeah. it, as, you know, it, it's a, it's a great gift, but it's also like anything you're told to sit and read when you would rather be doing something else. It's <laughs> it's it's it's, a, it's, it, you know, it, it's it's complicated, and and I, I do think, I think Brecht is mis, is misjudged. I did a production of The Life of Galileo as well, which is again one of the more pleasurable things uh, I've I've worked on, and so I think I think. You're abs it's not just this production, although I, I, I think generally, be because he studied more than he's seen, um, mm. unlike Shakespeare, <laughs> who's seen as much as he studied, um, uh, it's not more. That, that, that there's a mis there's a misjudgment, and and also the words, you know, even the word alienation. Even mm. if you've never seen a Brecht play and you've read somewhere that this is about this is a playwright who wanted to alienate people, it's not. You know, it's not easy. To grasp, is it? And and, and I, we also joke that the, the resistible rise of Arturo Ui next to Long Day's Journey into Night is probably the worst title <laughs> to get an audience. <laughs> Might we see uh, any more Brecht? Oh, I'd love, I'd, I'd love it. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing I'd like more. One, one of the great memories of my ch childhood was watching Miriam Carlin in Mother Courage. And if any, of you, oh, yeah. some of you will remember Miriam Carlin. She was a little sparrow and dragging this huge cart around the Nottingham Playhouse stage. Um, if I could, yes, if, if I could dream of a hmm. production to, I mean, I'd love to see us to see Galileo it here, but if I could dream of a production I'd put on that main stage, it would be Mother Courage. Ah, oh, you heard it here mm. first. Uh, is that Greg up there? Greg. <laughs> Hi. Um, given that the set looks chillingly familiar to those of us who saw the production last year, mm -hmm. But given that uh, this, this time last year you weren't anticipating the reading back this year, 
Mm-hmm. Where's the set been for the past year? How much we build you if you have to do it? Actually, we, we, I don't know. We kept, <laughs> actually, we, we kept, one, after the reviews and after the interest from Nika and other producers at the end of the run, we took a, a speculative decision to stick it in a store. Mm. We weren't, <laughs> you know, we, we the, the response was so un- surprising. We just thought we would investigate with these people. So, yeah, we mm. stuck it in a store mm. and, and, and most indeed, of it came out unscathed. Most of it came out and indeed some of the costumes too. So we went, we went that far. Thinking. Nobody had eaten too much in the past year. <laughs> <laughs> or shrunk. Uh, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in time on a tradition, I'm afraid, it's, uh, we've got to give the Playhouse back to the players. Um, they all need to get in and do their warm-ups. Um, so I just want to do a couple of um, housekeeping things. The post-show production talk of Ui is on Thursday. You don't have to have come in um, on Thursday evening if you want to come to the post-show talk, but you do have to get a ticket and, you know, health and safety and all that, as we know. Um, on Sunday, uh, the Youth Theatre is doing um, a celebration, I suppose, of 50 years of music theatre at CFT, and it's in aid of the Renew Project. It's almost all raised, isn't it? Almost all the money, but just a Last tiny bit more. Um, there are a few tickets left. It's on at 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock, and it's current Youth Theatre theatre members with a one or two older youth theatre members uh, coming back to support them. Uh, then on the 11th of September, <laughs> we're really, you're really doing the stuff for Uri, aren't you? Um, from page to stage, um, which is, uh, I suppose, a sort of discussion and more theoretical analysis of how you go from the text of the script to what you will have seen by then. And that's at 12 o'clock, also ticketed, um, but you can buy everything through the box office. On the 14th of September, <laughs> from 10 till 1, um, this actually, I realise, is a rather ludicrous thing to announce from the stage, um, uh, given the gangster theme. It is a workshop on concrete making, <laughs> <laughs> which I feel goes terribly well with Ui, but it's actually part of the heritage activity. Oh, okay. uh, nothing to do with uh, burying your enemy is <laughs> never to be found. Um, I am back uh, doing the next pre-show talk with the wonderful Angus Jackson and Tim Firth, which is about Neville's Island. Um, and that's going to be on the 18th of September, same time, same place in here. And then we'll be on the 23rd doing the pre-performance interview with Jeremy Heron about another country. And at that point, we will all collapse in a, a, a heap on the floor. Um, you've been a wonderful and attentive audience. Thank you so much. I know many of you come to all of these talks and it's enormously appreciated. Um, Jonathan is off on holiday. Very well hmm. deserved. Simon, I'm sure, isn't. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to thank Jonathan Church and Simon Higgins.